and click record. Um, so with all of that said, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Brems. I use he, him pronouns. I'm based in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, and I'm our vice chair and currently serving briefly as interim chair for Statistics Without Borders. Um, been on our executive committee, and we are so, so excited. I get to work a lot with Shloka. I get to work a lot with the marketing and communications team. And one of the biggest things that we've heard from you as volunteers, uh, there's, there's been a lot of clamoring for engagement you say we want to be involved with more projects. We want to figure out, you know, we've got this 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 uh, gigantic network of volunteers around the world. How can we use it? How can we connect with people? How can we learn more and develop our skills as statisticians, as data scientists, as economists, as 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 everything? Um, so I'm just very very excited for all of the things that we're going to go through today. I'm excited for future marketing um, events specifically focused on networking and and helping you all as volunteers. So thank you for volunteering. Thank you Shloka and thank you Anna for putting this together. And I hope that everybody has a wonderful full time today. Um, I will toss it over to Simran, who is currently our external communications coordinator. Thank you, Matt. Um, yes, so I am uh, part of the external communications team. Basically, what I'm responsible for is running the social media, so the Twitter, the LinkedIn group. Um, we are currently looking to have other volunteers on board um, to help with the work, so that will come out really soon. So if anyone is interested in volunteering in like a different way, um, please do reach out to me. Um, I'll also leave like my LinkedIn in the chat if you guys want to reach out to me directly. And I'm going to pass the mic on to Michelle. Hi, I'm Michelle Vanchu Orozco. Um, she, her, hers, uh, right now sitting on the um, territory of the Lekongan people. Um, particularly the Songhees and the Esquimalt peoples um, of the North Pacific Northwest, um, Victoria, British Columbia. So I do a couple of things. I started out as a program manager, um, working with SWV a few years back. And what I do with that is I try and coordinate um, engagements, mostly just the JSM uh, engagements right now. So every, all Every year, I believe, since 2015, skipping one year, SWB has made a presentation, either a panel presentation or a presentation of one of the projects as, at the joint statistical meetings. Um, as well, uh, I was dabbling in video making with a program called We Video when I was doing my postdoc over at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, British Columbia was talking to Matt one day and he's like, hey, do you wanna work with the Marcom team to do a little bit of video making? So I said, yes. And since then, um, between Matt, Slope and myself and a few other members of Statistics Without Borders, we've created a few onboarding videos that you might have seen on our YouTube channel. And we're looking to create more as well. Um, one of the first major projects I did was for one of our presentations at JSM 2019, I think it was, um, where we did the Asante Africa video in collaboration with Asante Africa, which was a joy to do. Um, it takes time, but I think it comes out quite nicely. And that's kind of me in a nutshell. Amazing. Thank you, Michelle. Please, I put the link for our YouTube channel, SWB YouTube. So if you want to take a look at all the videos that um, uh, that Michelle has helped create, please do so. We also have Shannon, who's going to introduce herself. Uh, Shannon does a ton of work behind the scenes. And uh, just for people to know that, you know, there's ways to volunteer to interact with SWB that's on projects, but then there's tons of work that happens even behind the scenes. So Shannon, if you want to take a minute or so and quickly uh, tell us about yourself and all that you're doing. Hi, I'm Shannon Lacerre Cortez. I am calling in near Baton Rouge, Louisiana, in the US. Um, in my real life, I work as an education researcher. What I do for Statistics Without Borders, I'm the Associate Director of Operations, um, and we do a lot of the behind the scenes work, maintaining the um, membership database, we are the ones that send out the emails for the call for volunteers. Um, we maintain the SharePoint site, uh, the OneDrive where we store all the data. 
we have five members right now um, and we are sharing a ton of work. So if anybody is interested in helping out with operations, um, you can let me know, drop a note in the chat. I will also um, put my email address in there if anybody is interested in helping out. But um, like you know, previous members have said, there are many ways to get involved in SWB besides just being on a project. And so I hope to hear from you guys. Amazing. Thank you, Shannon. And this is just goes for not just right now, but all the time. If you if there are certain kinds of events that you really want to see, please let us know um, if you want to do certain kinds of things. If you if you don't care for a certain kind of thing, please let us know about that as well. We really want to be um, to engage with you and listen to you and really provide the kind of events that you want to see. So without further ado, I would like to um, have Anna, who is our networking coordinator who's also very graciously offered to talk to us about data visualization. Uh, Anna, please go ahead, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. I will start sharing my screen. Um, you can see I have uh, visitors. Um, cats are just like that. They just come and go whenever it pleases them. So um, we shall see what she will do. Um, one moment there. <laughs> I need to do the classic thing of rejoining Zoom, so I'll be back. No problem. <laughs> While Anna hops off and hops back on, one quick thing that I want to say that I, I forgot to mention earlier, um, Shloka and Shannon and their respective teams have done a ton of work lately focused on updating our website. So if you've gone to statisticswithoutborders.org lately, it looks the same as it has for a long time. Uh, we are in the process because we are growing as an organization. We've got a lot of additional volunteers, a lot of new people who are joining. And so with that, we need to, um, we've actually needed to transition services to a new web hosting organization. So more details will be coming out about that uh, to all of you over the next couple of days. But if you look at statisticswithoutborders.org, now. And if you look at it like later tonight or maybe tomorrow, uh, you'll see that it will look very different. And that is all thanks to the hard, hard work of the operations and the marketing and communications team. So uh, keep your eye on that. And as has been mentioned before, we're always looking for new volunteers to help out with that. So another shameless plug if you're looking to get involved. So I'm back. <laughs> the classic, you know, that uh, thing with the latest Mac. Uh, uh, my apologies. Okay, so um, here we go. Um, can you see a deck here? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And can you see the next slide now? Yes, I yes. can. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, so then I think we're in the right place. Um, okay, so yeah, I thought I would introduce myself. Yeah, so I act as a networking coordinator with Statistics Without Borders starting um, this this year. Um, what we're trying to do is uh, we're trying to start up some events going and get you guys involved in uh, basically every way possible, um, including some of these uh, sort of events. And we would like to get your feedback afterwards to understand uh, what, what, what you would like us to do more of or less of. Um, in my sort of daily life, I work at Rovio. Um, it's the company behind Angry Birds. I am actually no longer in data science. I am now a senior product manager, so I am responsible for growing the product, but it does have a lot of involvement in the data and due to my background in data analysis, um, the, the, therefore my interest in um, the subject and in the organization. So um, that is a brief about me. I am a cat lady, but don't let my dog hear it. So a little bit about the agenda. So I would like to talk a little bit about visualization principles in general, um, how to use those. I am a massive fan of Tidyverse, uh, so I will definitely push ggplot on you guys. I would like to introduce maybe a little bit more about the ggplot thinking, um, maybe um, bring a little bit uh, tips and tricks here and there. And then um, I hope we have time, I will talk fast. Um, but uh, I hope we'll have time to turn a uh, very sort of simple plot into a quite a difficult one. 
So this is one of my favorite things to show. This is about how our brain perceives um, the different shapes and the different lines and everything. And here, what you can see is the, um, the top left corner, you probably see um, three rows instead of four columns. And that is just because of how our brain accepts proximity. So the points on the on the in the square they are a little bit closer in the on the horizontal axis than the vertical, and then our brain instantly thinks it's rows, not columns. And that is something that we are able to utilize in the um, um, in the visualizations that we do. Um, the next. I would like to highlight is super important when we're doing visualizations. It's the seeing objects as a part of a group. Yet again, you're seeing two rows of dark and two rows of uh, light um, circles, as opposed to just seeing 16 circles that are just, you know, on their own. And similarly, with enclosure, um, um, some separating them with a border means that we see two rows of four instead of the four separates, four separates in the middle. This is just the sort of brain playing tricks on us. And now here, do we see six different items? Probably we don't. We see three groups of brackets instead of six individual ones because we instantly think why and they are symmetrical and they are very similar. Well, they are same shape, but symmetrically um, organized and therefore we connect it to be in groups. Now, closure and continuity are also super important. What we basically see here is that we see a square and we see a circle. We don't just see scribbles. And similarly, we see a continuous line, even though we know there are gaps. And this is super important, especially when we're talking about line charts, because when we come to line charts, um, the viewer perceives them as a continuous thing. Therefore, a continuous variable needs to be used because otherwise our brain connects the, the different items, even though they may be completely irrelevant. Finally, of course, here, this is becoming more and more apparent as more I flick through it, but of course, connected dots become the same group. So we can separate the groups and for example, slope graphs do it quite well. So when you have two sort of two uh, starting points and then you have slope charts that kind of go from one point to another and their connection plays such a huge role. And here with the figure in the background, you can see you can choose what to look at. You can choose to look at the two faces or you can choose to look at the vase. <clears throat> but you basically cannot see the two of them at the same time. The, the one figure will become the background. So these sort of interesting uh, tricks are uh, something that got me on the into the visualization on the first place. But what I wanted to also highlight is um, sort of going back to the practicalities. I want to highlight the storytelling with data. I think it's a must read for, um, for any one of us that is um, sort of communicating the findings, communicating the insights to other stakeholders, because I think it's such an amazing book and it focuses so well on the nice, yay, go Matt. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have it here as a reference as well. This is one of my go-tos. It's, it's amazing principles. It's so good in terms of teaching you how to capture attention and how to grab the, 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 person's, the person's attention and, and draw the attention to the right points. So just a little bit more about the general principles. So we need to remember things like who is the main audience. Of course, that comes naturally, but also what is the main point that you want them to know? A lot of the time we will dig through the data and find so many different items, but in reality, our stakeholders really will need to know one or two pearls, the points of the story. Um, then what is the action? And from there, what is the mood? What is the message that we want? Because the visualization type might also depend on how and what we want to communicate. And what is the action that we want the person to have afterwards? 
And finally, who is the decision maker and what potential biases may they have? So it's, 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 I'm sure we have all encountered this in the past. It's very easy to draw conclusions we want, but how to avoid that when we're looking at the data, when we've checked so many different things that we know um, we can prevent this bias from happening. So this is a sort of quick which chart to pick sort of uh, rundown. Um, I guess th none of them are particularly hidden. I think the only thing that I want to highlight is the continuous line implies a connection. I see this often and you will see, I'm sure you see terrible visualizations too from a variety of newsmakers or newspapers and all kinds of agencies where um, say different people will be on the X axis, um, for example, with like election data and then the line will be connected. But they are not at all connected, they are different people. So this, this is a um, common pitfall. Now coming to more controversial things, slope graphs. So I love them for two point uh, comparisons, two points in time. This is also something that is much highlighted in the storytelling with data. And I'll be honest, I absolutely um, took it from there. And um, then the bar graphs. So this, this uh, I think, in a group of saying it in a group of scientists may be controversial, but I would say that for, for a general reader, a bar graph is more uh, understandable than a histogram. And I, I literally, when I was making and running down through this presentation yesterday, um, my partner, who is a uh, scientist in the past, and he was grilling me as to why not histograms. I guess the point is that um, the bar graphs are already aggregated and they've done the job, like that you've already done the job of the brain of the viewer for them. So uh, maybe that's why I find it easier. Uh, stacked bar and line, um, they are great, but not for interpreting um, massive trend changes over time. This is something I see all the time. And here's my go-to controversial opinion. Um, pie charts is a big no. And um, why is a pie chart a big no? So here I'd like to, let me see if I can see a chat. So right in the chat, this is a chart of my, the things I like. And I would like to ask you a question of, do you think I like cats more than dogs? And do I like sushi more than cats? So any, um, any guesses? Of course, it's a trick question. Of course, with pie charts, it's all, always a trick question. So here we have, exactly, um, pie charts, <laughs> cats more than dogs. Well, yeah, cats more than dogs a little bit. Um, yes, so some people did get it right. Um, but I think it just makes your brain work. Like it, 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 it makes the cogs, you feel the cogs moving. And one sort of easy fix for this is a bar chart. So this is my go-to sort of fix a pie chart here. You can clearly see cats are the best dances, mm, not so much, um, but in a grand scheme of things, you know, cats and dogs are pretty similar. So uh, that's, that's what, uh, and then down, down the line, we also want to make sure that, um, you know, what is the message? So let's say that we want to show that I like cats slightly more than dogs. So going with the storytelling of the data, um, uh, approach of stripping down and building up. So we remove all the noise, remove everything that is uh, sort of possible to remove without uh, removing the essence. Use color wisely to attract attention. Remove the defaults, always remove the defaults. Um, this, the reading time is actually 52% slower for people when this axis is rotated. So let's try to avoid the rotated axis at all costs. And one other thing that is quite important and that will sort of unlock the visualizations, um, the visualization beauty is the Z eye movement. So that is how we usually look at images. And this is something that we can use by making sure that the top left corner contains the information that we want people to see first. Let's say a legend 
or a descriptive title or a set of colors or I don't know, a logo. Um, it may be that you want people to see different things, but the most important thing is that you want to put it on the top left corner. So let's, um, yeah, one other trick is the look away and, and, and return back to it. This is a go-to trick to figure out what is the first thing that people see, because we look at the chart all the time. It's very easy to forget, you know, what we're looking at. Look away, get back. And this is the, what the audience will see first. And is that really what you want? That's the question. All right. So the starting point is this chart. Now we're removing y-axis, similarly removing the grid, stripping down the color. Remember how we want to highlight the cats. So we're going to highlight the cats here, then moving the title to the left, increasing the text size. Some subjective scale is added um, because sometimes it just makes a big difference. Now, here are the two charts. So I think that the one on the right is much easier to understand and it communicates a bigger message than the one on the left because where everything is important nothing is important so we highlight exactly what we want the people to see now ggplot the power of ggplot is immense and I think that it can literally make any visualization happen. Um, of course, you can always resort to things like Adobe products, but um, like Adobe Illustrator, I know some people who do that with say infographics, but um, the ggplot, I think it can do most plots very, very well. And you can see kind of the basic ggplot and the enhanced ggplot versions. So I think that the left one is, well, hard to read because because of the x-axis I personally have the difficult have, have the um, hatred of the default blue and default red um, just because they they punch my eye um, and I really don't like uh, that uh, I also think that they are both equally um, bright which makes it very hard to distinguish between what's 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 the part that you want me to see really so Going on with the extra libraries. So you may or may not know there's a whole lot of libraries around ggplot in the whole tidyverse. And why does it matter why, why use them? I will actually highlight quite many of them in this talk. Um, but uh, as a first go-to thing is it just makes things easier it, and it just makes it easier for you to make pretty things. So it's much easier to add um, titles, um, footnotes, um, combine charts together, um, make labels not overlap, um, have different beautiful, um, more beautiful um, color schemes and things like that. So moving on to the thinking behind ggplot. So ggplot is all about layers. Every single thing you do is a layer. It is building on top of what you've done before. So if you've ever been frustrated as to why it's like drawing on top of the existing chart, that's why, because it, it gets a canvas and then just continuously paints on the canvas layer by layer. You usually start with the base layers and then continue on to, um, continue on to the more nuanced items. So um, here we, um, this data represents the usual data argument that we would give. Then the aesthetics is the AES, so that's what it stands for. And then uh, geometric objects which lay on top of the two are the ones that are actually representing the data. So the points, the lines, the everything. So if you ever need to add anything on the chart, it is the geom that you're adding. And then a variety, variety of additional things that you don't actually have to do, um, but they do sometimes look nicer. Now, this one is a little bit missized, so I'm just going to skip to the next one. What kind of data do you need in order to use ggplot? And if you're not familiar with tidyverse, um, there is such a strong concept of tidy data. So um, the data on the left um, is, is a not a tidy data because we have a variable per column. And on the right, um, we actually have the long format 
of the data, which is considered tidy. And there we have the, the variable, the single value is in a single row. How does it affect the ggplot chart making? How does it affect the ggplot chart making? So here you can see that the same chart, I, it's cut off, but I promise you it's the same. And I will share with you the not cut off version. It's just that um, the presentation layout is a bit um, wrong in this uh, package. But here you can see the same chart is made with two different lines or one line. So what that means is, if we ever add more robot types into this mysterious robot data, we will have to add a new geom point versus with the long format, because the data is, is automatically manipulated into the types being in, the in, in different rows, um, the robot type will be automatically added here. So if we get 10 types, they will still all be here with all the different uh, colors. So let's make a few plots where we should go through this fairly quickly, but we can do it. So uh, my um, one of my favorite things to look at is the Economist visualization team. And actually um, one of these, um, I think two years ago, they've actually uh, done a blog post about how they've drawn the wrong slides. So, sorry, the wrong charts. So um, they uh, put, pointed out that this chart that they made was actually a bit harder to read than it could have been. So, um, and we can see here on like the comparison between the two. And so um, at first, I will, well, in this talk, we will uh, focus on replicating this chart as closely as possible, but not too closely. Okay, so starting with the ggplot, so layer by layer. So the first ggplot, just an initiation function with the data of argument will just create you a canvas. So this is a canvas, the chart already exists and everything that you build on top, you will put right on top of it. Now we will add the lines. So with adding the lines, what we're doing is we're adding the geom. So we are adding the geometric object. Instead, we could be using points or bars or anything, but for the sake of the visualization, we're going to use lines. Now, what's important is that because we have the data in a long format here, um, we are wanting to um, make sure that the lines are different. And this is where the group category comes in. So this is what we are splitting our lines by. Now we add the color with a simple color. So, and R is beautifully using the uh, English um, spelling, the UK spelling of English. So it's color with a U. Um, but actually, I think after many complaints, I'm pretty sure that uh, ggplot now actually takes into account, like it, you can pass a color argument without a U. But this wasn't the original. All right, so then we will add the right colors. That's just my manual scale. And um, this can be done in a more elegant way, but I think this is okay. So, and what we're doing here is we're building on top of it. So sometimes if you mix up the layers, it will actually do different things than you expect. So it's not going to act as well. So you want to build a layer on top of the layer. And if the next layer doesn't exist, sometimes it's just not going to work. So let's remove the ugly categories from the right. Uh, which is as simple as removing the guides. This is a very easy shortcut function. Um, then uh, theme underscore classic is my go-to function to make everything better because it's so pretty and very clean. So theme classic makes things easier. Now, if we were to add theme items, so th say we will do it more in the future, but say things like a grid line or a label or anything like that, we have to do it after the theme classic, because otherwise the theme classic layer is just going to take everything and remove it. Because you're building layer by layer, so every single change is, uh, it has to be consequential. Now, this is what it looks like right now. Mm, we're kind of getting there. But uh, we want to add more labels, increase the size, 
um, X axis, Y axis, clearly different. Um, title and subtitle will matter. And then finally add the grid lines back. Now, inside the theme, we can also change items. So inside the theme classic. Theme classic is a shorthand for uh, getting um, some of the parameters already figured out. So you don't have to specify every single one like access.x.continuous equals element none and, and, and so on. Um, so it's just a shorthand, but you can still pass the parameters that you can to the theme. So then um, we will increase the line size. And uh, the size is, size is um, so here's the difference between aesthetic so between passing the argument inside the aesthetic, so AES, and, beside, and aside from um, outside of the aesthetic. So the difference is that the aesthetic always takes it from the data. So if the size was different, for example, based on the number of participants, the size of the segment or whatever, I'm really sorry, my dog went to drink her water. Um, it, so if, if the size matters based on the data, we must include it inside the aesthetics. But because our size is fully arbitrary, we're going to put it as an outside argument. So if you were to put size equals two here, it would make a legend and say size equals string two. So it's because it thinks that it's a piece of data. Um, instead of uh, making it an actual value of two. Now let's fix the axis. Actually, we can use it. Uh, we can uh, use the scale x date, which is an inbuilt function. Um, it's it's very handy. You can actually say very human readable date breaks. So it can be six months, three months, two days, three weeks. It actually understands. Um, English, which is quite nice, and the date label. So this is the regular um, uh, sort of date notation. Um, yeah, so on to the y-axis. On the y-axis, we want to add the percentage sign. And here I would like to introduce another a very handy library, which is called Scales. Scales will uh, make it very easy for you to um, display things correctly. Display things with commas, with as, as numbers, with spaces, as dollars, as euros, as literally any, any, any scale, any formatting that you can think of, it's got it. And how we do that is uh, we are going to add it into, into the um, labels argument here. So um, we make sure that the scale um, the, the breaks I defined manually, so it's not the best, um, but, um, you know, we can work with that. And the labels percent, so here the function doesn't actually need the parentheses, so we're just specifying that it's the percent. But it still is not great because we don't have the decimal points. And that is very easily fixed if we use the percent format function instead and then use the accuracy. Um, parameter. All right, so now we need to move it, the y-axis to the right side, which is very easy by saying position equals right. So all of these things, I know they're kind of, they can be overwhelming, but you can always find it in like Stack Overflow or something like that if you just search for it. But just so you know that it exists, you can do this. Now what we want to do is add labels and titles and add the grid back. For labels, so yeah, here we're adding the grid back. The labels, so here I would like to introduce GG Repel. If you've never used it, it will literally save you um, many frustrations um, in terms of uh, plotting many, many labels, uh, labels or texts. Um, so you can see with no, with absolutely no imp impact, no input from me, other than using the gg repel function, we are able to see that actually the, the text is not overlapping with the point. Magic. You would imagine it's so simple, but this is just very simple. It will literally take any data point and put it away, which can take, it, it can be two extremes because sometimes the label will be like on the top right if there's like a cluster of data points. 
But this is exactly what we need to deal with. We don't actually have a label for every single point that we've got on the list. Um, we want to only use a few different points, like different two points, actually. One for right and one for wrong. So here I'm going to create a rank for each variable uh, in the category. So essentially, we want to pick um, one data, one rank, so one order on the um, date axis. And uh, then we will add a label data column with category. Uh, and NA character is just going to make everything else NA so that it's not actually displayed. So this is what it looks like. So we've added a new data, um, but uh, well, we've added a new column. So here the X and Y are the same and the color and label are different. And note the name of the function. So usually you would use a geom label, but when you use the gg repel, then you use geom label repel. So, and it will automatically go away from the point, from the data point. Now we will increase the size and uh, just make sure to you know, move it a little bit. Now here's the cleanup time. So this is something I want to highlight. So as you can see, we have a lot of repeating lines. Let's imagine we were to rename the data frame um, because Brexit is a bit of a um, word that we might not want to put in an open source or something like that. You would have to retype it like at least twice. And if you were to put more geoms later, it would be um, a, a, even more of a headache. But because they are repeating, what that means is we can put it all into the initiation function. So all of the items below the ggplot function will be using this uh, data. So um, the, as you can see, we, don't, we no longer have to specify the x and y because they're exactly the same as the x and y from, for, for the lines. We don't really have to you know, bother with that again. I think this makes the code much more reproducible and much less prone to like copy pasting all the time. So this is a trick. Then we will remove the access titles. This code is completely hidden. Now, what we want to do is add a footer and a title. So here uh, we will use grid extra. This library is maybe a little bit more complicated but the main thing is that it creates grobs, graphical objects, and then you can like glue the two together. So here we have two different charts and now it's the same chart and in a very simple way. And actually here you can even see so number of columns or if you wanted to put it one and then one below, it would be number of rows. So it's actually very straightforward. And this is what we're going to use. Oh, there you go, number of rows. And then you can also put some very arbitrary big book, I love flowers text. So here um, we create the different groups. So graphical objects um, with uh, some text. I think that this, the explanation for this stuff will take quite a long time, but uh, the idea being that we create different text, we create an image and then we glue it all together. Um, this is not ideal. Uh, this is just to highlight that uh, when we say x equals zero and y equals zero, it takes it quite literally and actually puts the middle of our uh, text in the zero. So we need to move it a little bit manually. Um, yeah, and finally, GG themes. This is an actually, uh, no, actually it's not finally. There's one more library coming, but GG themes, Really cool, very easy, um, very easy theming for your charts. If you want to reproduce Excel for whatever reason, you, you might want to do so. But finally, the R Color Brewer. This is my go-to library for any kind of um, uh, palettes, color palettes that, that are very nice, very pleasing to the eye. They've done all the work for you. So there is two functions that you need to know of. There is the scale color brewer, that's for categorical variables, and scale color, color distiller, that is for the continuous variables. And you can do very, very pretty charts. I don't think it works as well for continuous variables, but for categorical, it's just so pretty. So in summary, a few do's. So 
Um, and the first one is do not. So the first one is do not use the defaults. Um, try to use the theme classic to strip down and build up from there. Um, there are a few very nice shorthands. Labs is for access legends, titles, and guides is for the legend itself. Sometimes you'll have multiple legends and it's annoying. Finally, use pre-made uh, palettes for uh, the distinct, uh, for the discrete data and um, use scales to make sure that your uh, variables are correct. And then the theme and theme classic will be able to, will, will be um, providing you with uh, some shorthands. And the geom text, geom label will make it, sorry, repels, they will make it easier for reading. Cool. It's a little bit more than 25 minutes, I apologize, um, but maybe we don't have that many questions. And if we don't, what we could go towards um, breakout rooms. So in the breakout rooms, um, we would like you guys to talk about the talk and what you think. So first of all, where do you stand on the pie chart uh, controversy? controversy? Do you, as me, believe that um, they are the worst or do you think they have a place to be? And uh, what are your thoughts on the plot types and all the different, um, all the different uh, usage? And then what is the one thing that you learned today? Awesome. Ah. There's a lot of, uh, yeah, Anna, please go ahead. Wait a second. So an answer to Aidan. So I've used ggplot more than shiny, but I have seen any, no, wait. No, it's not to Aiden. It's we may use Shiny to produce interactive plot, but ggplot produces static plot. I actually have a tip for that. If you install a library called Plotly, you are able to interactify any chart you make with ggplot. Yeah, library Plotly. And calling a function called ggplotly after you display your chart in R will make it interactive. So it's like, it's, it's, it's magic. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Now that's <laughs> Amazing. Oh my God. Thank you so much, Anna. So thanks to all. Love the conversations and the activity in the chat. Um, we do have breakout rooms. Feel free to, um, I'll also put the prompts in the breakout rooms. Um, if you want to stay there for a good, you know, five, six minutes, that's fine. If you want to leave now, it's really, we understand it's, uh, probably the middle of the day for many of you. If you're interested in giving a talk like Anna just did, please let us know. We really want to hear from you, want to hear your expertise as well. Um, if you want to hear something, hear about something, please let us know as well. Um, so we will go ahead and put you all in breakout rooms. Um, and yeah, really nice to say thank you, Anna, for taking the time to really take us through um, data visualization. <laughs>
Hey, see what?